year as an industrial relations tribunal as a part of the dispute resolution machinery of the state. And it's important to remember that in 1946, and indeed for many years after, um, conditions of employment were generally governed by collective bargaining. We had very little in the way of employment rights legislation. Now, uh, as I speak, there is two terms that I will use, and I will explain them uh, at, the, at, at the commencement. We often talk about disputes of interest and disputes of right. Now, a dispute of interest is that an industrial relations dispute. People claim something because they believe they should have it. Uh, it's not based on any legal entitlement. It's, a, it's a, an issue of interest. We talk then about <coughs> employment rights or disputes of right, and they relate to matters that are governed by law. So if a person has a legal right to something, they assert that right, and there is a necessity for institutions who can vindicate those rights. Um, now the Labour Court was originally established uh, as an industrial relations tribunal dealing with disputes of interest. And there, weren't, there wasn't that many issues of right around in those days, and indeed for for many years after. I often, uh, I often say to people that when I started as a trade union official in 1973, you had in those days the Holiday Employees Act, I think of 1971, shortly replaced by the Holiday Employees Act of 1973. You had the Redundancy Payments Act of 1967. You had the Minimum Notice of Terms of Employment Act came along in 1973, and very little else. There were conditions of employment acts which had limited application, but by and large, conditions of employment were determined by collective bargaining and collective agreements, and disputes about collective agreements invariably ended up in the Labour Court. Um, so if, if the Labour Court was established for that purpose. As time went on, um, it, it was given jurisdiction in some important employment rights disputes, most notably when the, uh, what was then the Anti-Discrimination uh, Pay Act, the Equal Pay legislation was introduced. The Labour Court was given the arbitral role in that. And then when the Employment Equality Act of 1977 was enacted, the Labour Court was given the role of that. And very little else until much later on, and we look at what it does. But in, in, in the early 1970s, for the first time, the Labour Court was given jurisdiction to deal with legal disputes, disputes on matters of legal entitlement uh, in the equality area of um, the Redundancy Appeals Tribunal was established under the Redundancy Payments Act of 1967, originally to deal with disputes concerning redundancy pay. It was then given uh, a role in relation to disputes concerning minimum notice in 1973. And the major change for the what was then the Redundancy Appeals uh, Tribunal came in 1977 with the passing of the Unfair Dismissals Act, and the tribunal was renamed the Employment Appeals Tribunal, and it continues. It deals with a variety of employment rights disputes. Uh, I think the vast bulk of its um, workload is in respect to unfair dismissals. Um, the Equality Tribunal was established uh, originally as part of the Labour Court, as the Equality Service of the Labour Court in 1974, expanded and, and renamed in 1977. <coughs> and in 1998, uh, it was set up as a separate body known as the Equality Tribunal. The Equality Tribunal deals with disputes at first instance 
concerning uh, the Employment Equality Acts. And it has functions also under the Equal Status Act, and they're, they're consumer issues. But in the employment sphere, its jurisdiction is confined to employment equality matters, and there's an appeal to the, to the Labour Court. <coughs> the Vice Commissioner Service of the um, Labour Relations Commission uh, was established in 1990 in its present form. Before that, the Office of Rights Commissioner was established under the Industrial Relations Act of 1969. Um, <coughs> originally, the Rights Commissioners, like the Labour Court, were uh, given a role in resolving industrial disputes, disputes of interest. Uh, minor disputes, disputes concerning individuals. They were a, a kind of a, a mini version of the Labour Court. Uh, but over time, their role has expanded greatly and they now have first instance jurisdiction in a, in a very significant number of employment rights matters, uh, including the Unfair Dismissals Act, but it's optional whether people wish to go there or not. Now, so that was, if you like, the way the system evolved. It evolved pretty well on an ad hoc basis. As, as legislation was enacted, it was given to one or other body, uh, and it was difficult at times to understand why the Labour Court, for example, was given jurisdiction in certain matters, and the Employment Appeals Tribunal was given jurisdiction in other matters, why some issues had to go to rights commissions at first instance. In the case of the Unfair Dismissals Act, you could bypass it and go straight to the Employment Appeals Tribunal. So, with the result that it was often difficult for even hard practitioners to know what goes where, uh, and even more difficult for people who might what wish to or might have no choice but to pursue disputes on their own unrepresented, which is an extremely uh, complex uh, landscape. Um, and very often, as a, uh, we have come across situations where the claim is, or an appeal is referred to the wrong body, and by the time the, the mistake is discovered, they're out of time, and uh, cases are lost. <coughs> um, also, there is a, I think, and there's, 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 while all of the bodies try as best they can to ensure consistency of decisions. Um, there was some inconsistency, and that was true, I think, of the bigger bodies, and I think the Employment Appeals Tribunal at the moment has potentially 40 divisions, and the, 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 the opportunity for inconsistency in a body that large <coughs> is considerable. I think it's also important to bear in mind that all of the bodies were set up as an alternative to people having to go to the ordinary courts and pursue their legal rights in the, field, in the employment field. Um, they were intended to be relatively informal. They were intended to be cheap, that a person would represent themselves if they wished. That they were, and they were intended to be speedy. Um, that hasn't turned out to be the case. And um, criticism has been left um, and within the, the trade union movement at what was perceived as the over legalisation of the process and a perception among many workers that you really need to be legally represented in order to pursue a case before a tribunal. And in some instances, the procedures adopted by tribunals have almost mirrored what happens in an ordinary courtroom. And, and that undermines the very purpose for which these bodies were established. It, it undermines their reason for existence. It was in order to avoid the rigors <coughs> of courtroom procedures and, and, and 
um, called processes that these bodies were established in the first place. So that was a, it was a, it was a concern about that. Um, and as I have already said, there were too many bodies with overlapping uh, jurisdiction. Um, in terms of getting in and getting out, and this is very important because for a lot of individuals who are taking a case, uh, the waiting can be extremely arduous. Uh, people are concerned, they're worried, particularly in a case where somebody has been dismissed from employment. Uh, they need to get a quick remedy. And particularly if the person, for example, is looking to be reinstated in their, in their job, and that can arise under the Employment Equality Act, it can arise <coughs> arises all the time under the Unfair Dismissals Act and all the rest of it. Delay can mean that reinstatement this was not a viable option any longer. So the in the in the Labour Court at the present, um, you can get in in about the eight weeks if you all your chick if you have all your ducks in a row. If you've got your paperwork done, your case is ready, uh, you can get in in Dublin in about eight weeks. Outside of Dublin, it's about double that because obviously the, the court is based in Dublin, it travels uh, around the country. Um, but given the times that we live in, we can't travel unless we've got enough cases to justify the costs associated with it. So it's about 16 weeks outside of Dublin. There are instances where the delay is much longer than that, but it's usually because people mm -hmm. linger. Uh, VAT, I, uh, the latest figures that I see, it's about 77 <coughs> weeks uh, in Dublin, and I think 81 weeks um, outside of that. Those, those are the figures that I, um, I see published. The Equality Tribune is worst of all. Um, it's about 117 weeks to get a case heard at first instance in the Equality Tribune. Um, and Quite frankly, that's that's unacceptable. Um, the purpose of the uh, reforms, the the object that they're seeking to pursue, uh, is to create a comprehensive, easily understood system. And what is intended is that the all of the first instance. Uh, cases. Everything will go firstly to a new adjudication service that's to be established within a reformed Labour Relations Commission to be renamed as the Workplace Relations Commission. And there will be an adjudication service uh, staffed by uh, people coming from a variety of backgrounds, something like the Rights Commission Service <coughs> at the moment and all employment disputes will go there at first instance. And there will be a single appeals body, which will be an expanded labour court. So all cases will go to the adjudication service for a hearing and a decision, and that decision can be appealed to uh, a, an expanded labour court. And that's what you'll have. You'll have one first instance tribunal, you'll have one appeals tribunal. The functions currently uh, exercised by the rights commissioners will continue to be exercised by the new adjudication service. Uh, the functions exercised by the equality tribunal will go to the adjudication service and the uh, equality tribunal uh, will eventually uh, be wound down and it cease to exist, it will be disestablished. And the first instance adjudica uh, uh, adjudication services provided by the Employment Appeals Tribunal, uh, which are in respect to redundancy, minimum notice, and the Unfair Dismissals Act, uh, where people 
object to a hearing before a Welsh Commissioner will go now to the adjudication <coughs> and an appeal will lie uh, to the Labour Court. So the Labour Court will be taking on the appeals, the appellate jurisdiction that the Employment Appeals Tribunal currently has. Uh, and um, it's intended that where cases are already in the system, uh, they will be dealt with finality by the, by, by, by the Employment Appeals Tribunal in the case of the Employment Appeals Tribunal. I think in the other bodies, uh, they will essentially be merged. But the Employment Appeals Tribunal will continue to exercise its current role in respect of cases that are already in the system. Uh, but for all future cases, and eventually the Employment Appeals Tribunal uh, will cease to exist, and that's the intention. Um, the, as I, I've already uh, mentioned to you that the Labour Court has two distinct roles at, at, at present. It's a industry relations function, which is a hugely important function that the court exercises uh, that I've spoken about. But it also has, as I said, over the years been given employment rights jurisdiction. And obviously um, the, the approach that the court has to take in dealing with an industrial relations case is very different to the approach that it would take in an employment rights case. I mean, if, if where the court is called upon to adjudicate an act dispute, it's essentially asking itself what is a fair and practical solution to this dispute. So you, you know, to use the, the, the language of the 1946 Act, the court gives its opinion on the merits of the dispute and the basis upon which it should be solved. So it's what is fair and reasonable and practical in the circumstances. Where the court is dealing with employment rights, uh, it's very different because it has to apply the law as it finds it. You might not like it at times, but you have to apply the law as you find it. It has to act judicially. Uh, that is to say that it, 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 there, there, there are requirements in terms of fact-finding and requirements in terms of the taking of evidence and so forth. It is different, but over the years, um, the court has demonstrated, I think, that it has the capacity to di differentiate between how you approach uh, employment rights case and how you approach, approach a dispute of wages. Um, most of the, and we look at it in a minute as to what the court currently deals with in the employment rights area, uh, a lot of the uh, legislation that we deal with uh, is derived from the law of the European Union. So it's necessary not just to deal with disputes for the application of domestic law, very often the application of European law is a factor that uh, will influence uh, and, and, and in some cases determine the outcome of the case. The most obvious example there is the, the Employment Equality Act. Our Employment Equality Act is based on a series of European directives and um, the jurisprudence of the case law uh, is such that you could wallpaper this rule several times over with all of the decided cases. And um, so it, it, can be, it, can be, it can be quite complex. Um, at present, um, and this is now before any of these reforms are implemented, uh, about 30% of our case law is in employment rights matters. But if you translate that into workload, the figure I've used there is 50%. It's probably a little bit more than that because it takes longer to deal with employment rights cases than it does industrial relations cases. And it certainly takes a lot longer to formulate and write up decisions, which you are, if any of you have ever seen any of the decisions that the court produces, for example, in the employment equality area, they can be fairly lengthy, 
reasoned, detailed, uh, and um, quite a bit of work goes into preparing them. So about 50% of our work, um, and I think that's a, a pretty conservative um, uh, estimate, uh, is already in the um, uh, climate rights field. Um, and the court has, over the years, I think, uh, demonstrated that it has the capacity to interpret and apply the law and do so correctly. Um, the issues, reasons, reasoned decisions in all the climate rights cases, uh, much more detailed than you get in an industrial relations case, which sometimes are a couple of paragraphs, but in the, um, the climate rights sphere, they tend to run into several pages. Um, and looking at if any of you have ever done it, but if you look at any modern textbook on climate law, uh, most of the you know, authorities that were relied upon are labour court decisions in the areas that we cover. Um, there is an appeal in, in, in climate rights matters. There's an appeal on a point of law available from the decision of the labour court to the high court. And there is another area where there is some complexity because um, for most of the body of employment law, uh, there's a first instance, a hearing, there's a de novo, which is a rehearing of the case on appeal, and a, an appeal on a point of law to the High Court. Um, the Unfair Dismissals Act is, is different in that there is uh, an appeal from the Employment Appeals Tribunal to the Circuit Court. And that appeal is a de novo hearing of the case before a, a judge of the Circuit Court. And there can be a further appeal to the High Court. I don't know if any of the cases ever gone beyond the High Court. No. I don't think so. But again, a full rehearing of fact and law. Um, the, it's proposed under the, uh, the new arrangements that uh, there will be only one appeal in any employment rights matters uh, beyond the uh, labour court, and that will be to the high court on a point of law only. And uh, the decision of the high court will be final and conclusive. There will be no appeal to the Supreme Court, for example. Um, and it will be on a point of law as opposed to a de novo hearing where the case is mm. effectively reheard. Um, in statutes that we currently deal with in the employment rights field. And you can see, as I mentioned earlier, with the Employment Equality Acts, we've had them since the employment equality legislation was first enacted in 1974. Um, the Organisation of Working Time Act, we, we were given jurisdiction for that in 1997. In fact, that was the first time since the 1970s that the court was given additional employment rights jurisdiction <coughs> under the, um, the Organisation of Working Time Act. Uh, we, were then, we were given the National Minimum Wage Act on its enactment uh, and two um, pieces of legislation which are very similar in terms of the underlying rationale and legal concepts to the Employment Equality Act is the Protection of Employees Part-Time Work Act and the Protection of Employees Fixed Term Work Act. They effectively provide for equal treatment in respect to conditions of employment for fixed term workers and for part-time workers. Um, there is one um, in there which is a kind of a hybrid between employment rights and, uh, employment and, and uh, industrial relations which is, in effect, in a uh, state of suspension at the moment, in that it's not being used, the Industrial Relations uh, Miscellaneous Provisions Act of 2001-2004. Uh, uh, and that was legislation that was enacted in 2001 to address the question, or to, to address in a fashion problems uh, that arise in employments where the employer will not engage in collective bargaining with a, a trade union. And um, while the 
approach of the court to that was very similar to the role in the uh, field of industrial relations because it was, it, what that act did was it gave the Labour Court the power to fix the terms and conditions of employment of workers in employment where the employer would not engage in collective bargaining negotiations. Um, and in a famous and not notorious uh, Supreme Court decision in um, 2007, um, the, uh, the, the, the Supreme Court took the view that this was a major intrusion into the rights of employers uh, and um, that uh, that had to be taken into account both in terms of the way in which the court dealt with those cases and in relation to the circumstances in which the, uh, the, the act could be invoked. The effect of that really is that we, we haven't had any cases in recent times under that legislation. It's, it's, it's effectively unworkable. Now there are discussions going on at the moment, I understand, with the view to trying to resurrect it and uh, cure some of the damage that was done to it uh, in the uh, Supreme Court decision of Alan Weiner. Um, we have a limited jurisdiction in respect to the Safety, Health and Welfare of Work Act. Effectively, the court's role uh, in that is an impelled role again uh, from a rights commissioner uh, where an employee contends that they suffered penalisation <coughs> uh, as a result of either exercising a right under the Safety, Health and Welfare of Work Act or making a complaint under the Act or, uh, uh, or uh, for having acted as a safety representative. Um, it, 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 it protects workers who, for example, refuse to work in an unsafe environment and if they're brought to any detriment in consequence of that, uh, it can be held that they were penalised and remedies are available under that act and the, the court has that. We have uh, jurisdiction uh, under the uh, information and consultation legislation, which gives effect to the directive on, on, on uh, information and consultation. Very, very limited role under that act, and I don't know if we've had more than a half a dozen cases since the legislation was passed. Um, we have jurisdiction under the Health Act. So it's, it's, it's a limited uh, jurisdiction because it's confined to protection of whistleblowers. And I think we've had one or two cases, no more than that, under that legislation. And the, 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 the most recent addition uh, to what we do is the um, Protection of Employees Temporary Agency Work Act of 2012. And that's again a piece of legislation which fits in with the Employment Equality Act, fits in with the Protection of Employees Part Time Work Act and Fixed Term Work Act, in that it is intended to provide agency workers with the same basic employment conditions that they to which they would be entitled had they been implied directly by the hire by the by the end user of the agency services. It's a as I said, it's a new piece of legislation. A, we've had a significant number of cases since its enactment, and it's a, a, again, it's it's complex to say the least, but, um, and to some extent, we're still going to find our feet with that. <coughs> um, within the reforms, uh, the court will retain all its existing functions, so it'll, it'll continue to be primarily an industrial relations body, it'll, it'll, it'll deal with all of that, uh, and it'll deal obviously with the uh, employment rights matters that it currently deals with, and it will get the, all of the appeals from the adjudication service under all of the employment rights statutes. Um, and one of the criticisms, and let me be absolutely clear, this stage, the Labour Court will do what is expected of it under the legislation which, from which it derives its authority. Um, so I'm not going to either 
praise or criticize what is being, <coughs> what is in contemplation. I'm simply explaining it to you that the court will do what it's required to do by law. Uh, and uh, they're not our reforms, they're the minister's reforms. Legislation is in an advanced stage of preparation at this stage, and the, the Labour Court is a creature of statute and will operate within the statute uh, that gives it its authority. But one of the criticisms that has been levelled <coughs> at the proposals <coughs> is that we could get our jerseys mixed up, that the firm, because it's primarily a, an industrial relations body, will adopt an industrial relations type approach to uh, dealing with matters of, of legal right. Now, there are many who say that's no bad thing, that the approach of the court and the relative informality of it is more akin to what these tribunals should be doing anyway. They shouldn't be replicating the courtroom procedures. It shouldn't, people shouldn't feel it necessary uh, to hire a solicitor and a barrister to bring a case. People do all the time. Uh, <coughs> sometimes I often wonder if they have to put a few bob to what they get if they win their case to pay the people that they brought, because there's no possibility in any of these bodies, nor will there be, for people to recover costs, nor, nor should there be in my view. That's very much a two-edged sword. We go down that route. It, 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 it can deter people from bringing things. Uh, um, but I will say, and it's been my experience uh, over the last 17 years that I've been in the court, that the court manifests differentiates in its approach from employment rights cases to industrial relations cases. It, it, it applies the law and I think that's uh, evident from the fact that there are very few appeals to the High Court and there are even fewer successful appeals to the High Court. So most of the time uh, where cases are appealed, the decision of the court is upheld. In, in the vast majority of cases, of course, but some are overturned, that's what appeals courts are for. Um, um, you might disagree with the decision of the appeals court, but you get on with it and you live with it. Um, the, and there is, in my view, no basis for the criticism, maybe the basis for other criticisms, but there is no basis, in my view, for the criticism that says that the, the Labour Court is not capable Expand the role that it's, that it's going to be given. Um, what will happen to the courts? Well, it's going to be different, of that there is no doubt. Um, it will continue to uh, provide, as I said, all of the important services that are currently provided. It will take on the appellate jurisdiction that the uh, EAT currently. Uh, as I said, the first instance uh, jurisdiction of the EAT will go to the adjudication service. Um, the appeals will continue to be, and our, our system is unique in this regard because I often speak to people in similar bodies in, in other countries, and um, this notion of de novo hearings, that's maybe a technical term for saying a rehearing of the case from the start, is pretty unique to our system. In Britain, for example, you get one hearing uh, before what are now called employment tribunals, and the only appeal from that is on a point of law. Here, people can run the same case twice, in the sense that you, you have a hearing in the first instance, and you have a full hearing uh, by way of an appeal. And you can present a totally different case if you want. You can learn from your mistakes in the first instance. You can introduce new evidence, you can bring new witnesses. Uh, what you can't do is change the, the nature of the case, but the presentation of it will be an off the mills totally different. Uh, and sometimes when you, when you talk to maybe the rights commissioners or equality officers, um, they sometimes wonder how the court managed a totally different decision than they came, they came to and what 
appear to be the same set of facts, but in reality, a, a very different case can be presented on appeal than was, than was presented in the first instance. But it is intended to keep that system where the appeals will be de novo. Uh, all of the decisions, uh, currently the, 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 the Labour Court had its own website until last year. All of the, there is now a single website for all of the bodies and all of the decisions are published on that and um, out of the new rate, all the decisions will go on the, both the first instance and the appeal decisions um, will, uh, will, 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 will be published on the, on the website. So it's, uh, the only appeal then beyond the Labour Court will be to the High Court with no appeal to the Supreme Court. Um, whereas where are we at now? Um, they're busy drafting. Um, the bill um, depends on who you published um, by the summer uh, with a view to its enactment by the end of the year. Um, whether that happens is another matter, I don't know. I mean, there, there, there's, uh, it's a, I've seen some of the drafts and it's a, it's a huge piece of legislation and it, it will be uh, amending practically all of the statutes in some respect or another. Um, but administratively, uh, there are a number of uh, changes are already taking place. There is now <coughs> a single complaint form. Before, if you wanted to take a case under the Organisation of Work Time Act, you had to go off and find a form to take a case under the Organisation of Work Time Act. If you had, for example, a claim under the Minimum Wage Act, and you, you had to get another form, and if you had a claim under the Redundancy Payments Act, you had to get another form. If you wanted to um, take an unfair dismissal claim, another form, and a different institution, all of that. So there's no a single form. Somewhat complex, but um, it's, 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 uh, there's a single form there. Um, a lot of the problems that you've uh, done is that will um, be ordered out. The object is that when the a complaint is lodged, and they're lodged centrally now and then sent to whatever the appropriate body is, um, that the employer will be notified within 48 hours. There were instances in the past where uh, claims were lodged, employers were complaining that they found out weeks later that there was a complaint against them. Uh, but it's intended that they'll be told within 48 hours. They've also established within the, um, the Labour Relations Commission, as it now is, uh, an early resolution service. It's, it was only, I think, set up about 18 months ago. Uh, and um, its um, success is being monitored. Um, I, I, I haven't seen up-to-date figures. In the initial stages, um, it was solving some problems relatively low success rate. It was primarily intended to, to sort out issues that should never go to any tribunal because in some instances it, there was, there was an un, the, the, the claimant had an unanswerable case. It was plainly wrong what happened. So for example, somebody doesn't get their holidays, right? Uh, unless the employer had some argument to, to advance about the person not being an employee or they weren't working there Ever. There is no defence to that. You get disputes about somebody not getting a, de, their conditions of employment as if everybody is entitled to get a statement setting out the main terms of their contract of employment. It's a requirement uh, under the uh, piece of legislation from 1994. And a huge number of disputes end up going to rights commissioners now where the employer can do it. And this service was intended to make phone calls <coughs> and ring up the cars and say, there's a person here says, it's, you, 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 didn't, you didn't give them the statement required under the Terms of the Private Information Act. Why don't you do it? Uh, somebody says they weren't paid for a public holiday. Why didn't you do it? And that, it was intended to take a lot of those type of cases out of the system and have them resolved <coughs> at a 
an early stage, uh, so as not to be flabbergasted. Um, and uh, that's obviously going to be uh, refined as it goes along. I think there's probably, um, it's a very good idea, but perhaps it's not for me to criticise it because it's in a, it's in a different organisation, but perhaps it needs to be beefed up somewhat. Uh, and as I said, we have a, there is now a single website for all of the bodies, uh, and that has been just done with the Ministry. Um, one of the points uh, that was raised in the early stages of this um, was that if the Labour Court was to be given all of this, that it should have specialist divisions, that it should have employment rights divisions, and it should have uh, industrial relations type divisions. Now, we don't want that, the Court didn't want that, and we argued against that. And we argued against it because it would lead to inflexibility. Uh, you could have a situation where you'd have some divisions that would run off their feet, and other divisions have some that are applied. Uh, for example, when the Court goes out of Dublin, as it does frequently, and the whole series all around the country, would you have a situation where an industrial relations division of the Dell here, in some cases, and another division would have to follow it to deal with other types of cases. So that simply wouldn't work from a, a practical perspective. Uh, and if people are appointed to the court, they'd be expected to do the, the full range of work that uh, the court is given responsibility for. And as I said, there is no basis for the suggestion that the court is impaired in any way uh, in dealing with employment rights matters by the uh, fact that it also does industrial relations work. Um, the court will take on a new role. Uh, there will also be uh, an, uh, a statutory officer uh, called compliance officer, which is a new <coughs> name for the that's our currently inspectors employed by an organisation called NERA, mm -hmm. uh, which is another organisation that's been uh, going into the, the Workplace Relations Commission. <coughs> and in certain types of uh, employment rights issues, it's possible for to bring a prosecution as well as bring a claim before um, for example, under the National Minimum Wage Act, it's an offence not to pay the national minimum wage. Uh, and that, under the present arrangements, a prosecution can be brought by an inspector against a defaulting employer. But the, that'll get the employer fined. And if the employee wants to get the national minimum wage, they bring a claim under the Act. And they do process it. Um, it's intended that, and, and but for example, there's no offence for not paying a woman the same rate as a man. That's not a criminal offence, that's a civil matter that, that can only go by way of complaint. <coughs> for example, in the, um, but under the Organisation of Work and Time Act, for example, there's a whole variety of offences that can be committed. Um, and the intention is that the compliance officers, new name for inspectors, still be able to bring prosecutions, but they could also bring a claim on behalf of workers uh, to the appropriate tribunal or first instance adjudication service. So, uh, for example, if, if, if in the course of an inspection uh, the uh, inspector discovers that people haven't been getting the minimum wage, well, not just can they prosecute the employer, but they can, they can actually make a complaint uh, to the court. There's also a provision where um, a compliance notice can be served on the employer. Now, <coughs> that particular provision, or proposal rather, is proving to be somewhat contentious and there's been concern expressed by the Attorney General. So I don't know if it's going to be in the final bill, but certainly the intention was that it would be a bit like getting a, a speed ticket. Um, you know, you could pay up and you know, 
by the prosecution. Uh, and the same could apply where in respect of forms and opinion that there's been a contravention of employment uh, legislation where it, there's a, a criminal sanction available that they could serve a compliance notice on the employer and the employer would have a period and if they rectify the matter, uh, well then that would be the end of it. Uh, but, they, um, but if the employer disputes the uh, compliance notice, Um, and the Labour Court could confirm or alter the compliance service. Uh, and then, if there isn't compliance, the matter will go to the District Court and in the normal way uh, it will be prosecuted as an offence. Uh, and the District Court, as well as imposing a fine in that situation, uh, can direct the employer to pay monies to an individual. Uh, obviously, because these matters are criminal offences, <coughs> they have to go to an ordinary court. The Labour Court couldn't deal with those constitutionally because no, uh, none of these tribunals can constitutionally exercise any criminal law jurisdiction. Um, in terms of the structure uh, of the court, um, the Labour Relations Commission currently share the same building, people often mix us up and we often see references to the LRC when they really mean the Labour Court and references to the Labour Court when they really mean the WRC or the, the LRC. Um, we we'll continue to operate in the same building um, and there is obviously very close synergies between the, the court and the commission and basically the same business. Um, there will be a lot of shared services between the uh, WRC and the Labour Court, but we will be standalone, independent bodies, uh, and neither body will uh, be shown to react by division, the division being the chairman or the deputy chairman, and an employer member and a worker member, unlike a lot of bodies, certainly unlike the AT. Everybody in the Labour Court is uh, a full-time member. People don't have other jobs. Um, the intention is that there will be one for the division of the court. Right? Um, and uh, there will be one for the deputy chair. And one of the uh, difficulties that the court has at the moment, particularly in the, the, the Bank Rights matter, as I said, there's a lot of work involved in making up decisions and all that sort of stuff. But that work is usually performed, it's always performed by the chair of the division. Right? And people need time to do that. And when they're doing that work, obviously they have to hear the cases. So you, you, you have divisions underemployed, and sometimes the chair's overemployed. Uh, and there's a lot of, <coughs> I'm the chairman of the court. <coughs> a lot of functions other than simply hearing the cases. But I do the same caseload as everybody else. Uh, and you have to try to find the time to deal with all the other stuff. Um, so the intention is that whereas now there's two deputies, the chair, three divisions, the intention under the uh, new arrangement will be that there will be four divisions and four deputies. So there'll be, you know, there'll be a spare chair at any given time. And that will mean that divisions will sit much, uh, much more frequently because people can simply come off cases and, and do their paperwork or whatever. And divisions will be able to. And there will be certain functions of the court that can be exercised by the chair or the deputy chair sitting alone without a division. Now, there'll be things like um, adjournment applications or administrative matters, but where they're, 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 and, and that don't require a decision as such uh, on the case. Um, and obviously that will free up divisions considerably. Um, the intention is that the chairs and the deputy, there was all sorts of informal and semi-formal arrangements in the past for the appointment of people to the court at deputy chair or chairman level. Uh, the 
intention is that, uh, and this will be written into the legislation, I'm sure, that all future appointments at the level of chair or deputy chair will be through the public appointment service. So, as I said, get your CVs ready. Um, um, the present arrangement in respect to the appointment of ordinary members is that there are no, there are there is one nominating body for worker members, namely the ICTU, uh, and whoever Congress nominates has to be appointed. The minister has no role uh, other than signing a warrant. There's no discretion. Uh, likewise, in the case of employer members, IBEC is the nominating body. Uh, they decide who is to be appointed. That person must be appointed. Uh, the intention under the new arrangement is that the nominating bodies will put forward a panel of no less than three people and the selection process will be put in place uh, by which one of those three people will be appointed. Um, and it's all supposed to be open and uh, transparent And criteria will be established. There is no criteria at the moment. It's, it's, it, 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 the vacancy arises for a, a worker member. The Congress decides what kind of a biological specimen they want to fill the role. Uh, and they have absolute uh, freedom to choose whomever they wish. Likewise with Um uh, It's intended criteria against which uh, selections will be made and the, the, that criteria will be taken into account by the nominating body and if the person that's nominated don't meet that criteria uh, they won't be appointed. Um, in terms of caseload, and this is, this is an area which um, people have been focusing on quite a bit. I mean, at, the, at the moment, the court deals with somewhere between 12 uh, and 1,500 cases a year. So that's, that's our current workload. Um, the EAT has 8,000 referrals and something of the order of 600 uh, or 6,000 cases disposed of. Now, they, they include there's also a difference really in, in, in the way in which statistics tend to be compiled because the Labour Corps, for example, might deal with a dispute involving 500 workers, but that's one case. It's just one case. Uh, in other bodies, every individual is <coughs> You can get confusion <coughs> around that, but there's, the, 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 the EAT has a very considerable workload. And quite frankly, of all of that, it's transferred A multiple of that, but <coughs> I, I carried out an exercise I was asked to do as to what the likely increase in the workload would be, and the only thing you can go on is, is really experience of um, you know, how many cases which are dealt with at the first instance are subsequently appealed, because we will just be dealing with appeals, and it's pretty consistent across all of the, the statutes. Um, at around between, somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of cases are appealed. I use the figure there, uh, around 12 percent. But for example, um, there's a, a, a low enough rate of appeal under the Employment Equality Act. And that might be to do with the fact that you know, it'll take you forever to get into the uh, Equality Tribunal, but the decision that comes out at the end of the day will be well reasoned and comprehensive. Um, and um, people don't appeal, you know, unless they believe that there's some prospect of the appeal succeeding. But they're, they're low at about eight percent, eight to nine percent of, of what goes to the inquiry, to the equality tribunal in the subsequent appeal, uh, and it varies across the board. But none of them go much above eighteen percent. The, the organisation.
organisation of open China for some reason has a very high rate of increase, but it's about 18 <coughs> percent. So the experience suggests that um, the, the appeals um, you get about 12, 15 percent of cases that are no, and that applies equally where. Um, cases currently under the Unfair Dismissals Act go to rights commissioners. And, you know, okay, they may be the, the, the less complex ones. But there, there's a, a, a low enough rate of appeal in those instances to be compliant with the APA. Um, but taking into account, as I said, the, the, the current pattern, right, um, and taking into early resolution service is in place and hopefully will be uh, refined sufficiently over the next while uh, to establish a higher rate of, of, of settlement, particularly on cases, as I said, which are almost routine in the sense that there's a clear contravention of a piece of legislation uh, and they shouldn't be good now with, uh, coming into the system at all. Um, but given all of those uh, and the uh, changes that will happen within the court A with the fourth division and the fact that all of the divisions can sit with the case, um, we reckon uh, that um, we will be able to manage uh, with those resources uh, an increase the order of about 56% in uh, our current um, caseload. So that's what we figure the data. If, if that turn, I mean, if to some extent you're into the unknown here, if that turns out not to be the case, well, obviously questions of resourcing will arise. Uh, but given where things are at at the moment and lots of public service, um, it's going to be. It's not going to be easy to look for, for more resources. But if that figure turns out to be there or thereabouts, uh, it should be possible to do that. Um, it's also because I'm conscious of the fact that I agreed to answer questions, so I'm hurrying on here. Um, there are a number of things which uh, are intended to happen uh, and are highly desirable. Quite frankly, the, the present body of legislation can, can be all over the place in terms of time limits for both <coughs> case, time limits for appeals and so forth. And it's proposed that all of that will be standardised. Right? Because at the moment, some case, in some instances, um, it's six months, but that can be extended by a full of 12 months for what's referred to as reasonable cause. In other instances, it could be extended by six months in exceptional circumstances. In other situations, the time limit runs from the end of the employment. In other situations, the time limit runs from the occurrence of the event giving rise to the dispute. In some instances, it's from the last occurrence. Right? For example, so it's all over the place. And that is um, to, um, to be standard. limit which would be six months but it'll all be from the same point right and the, uh, the uh, possibility of an extension will be on the same criteria I think we was never caused on the enforcement I mean one of the things about all of the employment bodies and it's, it's something that uh, arises from constitutional limitations on uh, what are technically legally referred to as administrative tribunals, but not courts, but administrative tribunals, is that you can't enforce your own decision. Right? So all enforcement currently is through the circuit court. Mm -hmm. right? Now that's to be changed, that will be given to the, um, the district. Uh, 
um, the regulations can be made under the Act uh, by the Minister in consultation with the court to regulate its procedures. Um, one of the distinguishing features of the court, as opposed to, for example, the EAT, uh, is that people bringing cases to the court must make written submissions. That's a written requirement. It could, it provides for much speedier disposal of the case, apart from anything else, because people go in knowing what the case is about. Uh, and um, it also means that you can have some idea as to how long the case may, may take, and you can take that into account in the program and so forth. Um, that's not a requirement with the EAT as I understand it. The Equality Tribunal do require written submissions. Rights Commissioners don't, but people tend to anyway. Uh, but um, all of these matters are minister. Um, the court already and will in the new arrangement I think to a far greater extent does engage in case management so you know if you, if you, if you see a case and it looks that, uh, that as it often is that one or other party is all over the place uh, you, you call the parties in and you try and put some sort of shape on it before you move into a full hearing um, and um, again that case management function could be exercised uh, by uh, a chair sitting alone without necessarily having a division. Um, and as I said, the preliminary applications and so forth can then come back to it. So that's my quick run around uh, the system. As I said, uh, the bill, when it sees the light of day, um, may, I, I haven't seen all of the provisions. I've certainly been consulted in relation to those provisions in the bill that would affect the court and I've seen some drafts but um, what precisely it will contain I don't think it will depart significantly from what I've talked to you about but um, we have to await the publication of the bill um, before we know the, the full detail and no doubt the debate will start uh, afresh when that happens. As I said uh, I'm not here to sell the proposals, I'm not here to criticise the proposals, I'm here to tell you what they're about, and as I said, um, as far as I'm concerned, and I think as far as all of my colleagues in the court are concerned, uh, we will do what we are asked to do, and we'll continue to do that as best we can, getting us right, hopefully, most of the time, getting it wrong some of the time, uh, but that's in the nature of things, but we'll do whatever we're asked. <coughs> um, and as I said, hopefully we can continue to provide the same level of service in terms of speedy disposal of issues and so forth as we have been doing uh, since the inception of the institution in 1946. So I'd be happy to answer any questions as best I can. <coughs>